Welcome back to the channel, everyone. Jason here with a massive, massive Starfield update. So yesterday, on Wednesday, August uh, 16th, they actually held a developer Q&A where people can ask questions and a couple of developers, Will and Emil, I, I'm going to go by their first names because I, I won't be able to pronounce their last names, but Will and Emil answered questions from the community and... There are some amazing questions or some amazing, amazing answers in their uh, responses. So I'm super excited. We're going to jump through it and what I think of the answers. And it goes without saying there might be a little bit of spoilers here. So they don't extensively spoil stuff, but there's going to be things that you might not want to know. So just a heads up, if you're trying to avoid all spoilers, this might not be the video for you. It's going to be, I'm going to consider it light spoilers. So there's some info in here that people might consider spoilers, but they're very light. There's no details like this is exactly what happens in the storyline. It kind of generally dances around it. So diving into one of the first questions that was asked, it is how deep should we go into creating our character's backstory before we start the game? So if you did not know in Starfield, you actually have a backstory that might affect the game going forward. And your backstory also gives you traits that'll actually increase your, your speech or your, your gun handling or whatever, your piloting skills. So it does have an effect on the game. But their answers were uh, from Emil. It says, we always make our games for fans, both old and new. So you can jump in without ever having played a Bethesda title before. Then uh, Will pops in and he says, there is a trait and background system that will let you specify more about yourself, but you can also select anonymous background and no traits if you want to. So you don't have to choose any of that stuff. You can actually go through with an anonymous background so no one knows anything about you from before the, the uh, game starts. Very, very cool, but you can also kind of customize it and these traits in the background will affect and help or maybe make your game more difficult going forward, which is really, really awesome. And speaking of backgrounds, there's actually a, uh, a trait and a background that actually plays into your parents. So there is a trait called kid stuff where your parents are actually in the game and you can go visit them. And there's actually a structure and gameplay around that, which is really, really cool. But the question is, if we get the kid stuff trait, will our parents be generated based on our character's look or are there standard parents that are in place? What benefits might there be? And their answer from Will is a really, really awesome. Our programmers are on our new face tech. We're excited to make a function that could try to match your custom face and then create the two parents. So they actually, they, they um, uh, Emil actually mentions this. This is actually something that they put in Fallout 3 and in Fallout 4, they will model your parents after you make your character because you can customize your character's face, everything about it. And then they make your parents based on that look. Very, very awesome. And Emil at the end mentions they were so into it, the voice actors. It was awesome. Oh, yeah. And you can get stuff. So you, if you go back and visit your parents, if you have this perk, you can actually go visit them and they will give you items. I don't know if that's a major item or if it's just kind of like Easter eggs. No idea, but very, very cool that that's actually in there. And it's a complete choice. You don't have to have this trait. You can totally ignore it and they will never appear in the game for you, which is really, really awesome. Another uh, quick question right here says, uh, can we buy houses or property in main cities? And Will just responds really quick and to the point. He just says, yep. There are houses in different cities that the player can get. Some you have to purchase and some are rewards for specific quest lines. So there are multiple different houses, just like in Skyrim. If you played the, uh, the special edition, when it first came out, there was no, there was not a whole bunch of houses you can get. But after the special edition came out, they had different properties, different homes you could buy. They don't go into detail about how you can like upgrade them or if you can or modify them. I'm assuming that's going to be in there, but they didn't mention anything about customizing your homes, but we do know that there are multiple different houses that you can buy or homes you can buy throughout the game. Very, very awesome. And 
some of them are rewards for specific quest lines, which is really, really cool. All right, and I, I, know, I know I'm doing this like in rapid fire, but I really want to get through a lot of these questions, and if the video is too long, people don't click on it. So sorry if I feel like, if it feels like I'm going really, really fast. Hopefully you guys are also reading the screen because you get more detail from the questions by reading the screen. You can see all of the different responses, but I'm just highlighting the the like detail, the, the pinpoint, the uh, bullet points that they're trying to get across. So the next question is, how many companions total will we be able to recruit in the game? Right off the bat, Will says there are over 20 named characters who can join your crew. And I like how we specifically put out named characters. What does that mean? Maybe we have other characters, like maybe there's a robots or maybe there's other crew members on your ship that are not named. They just kind of walk around and do the, like they're working on like the engineering or whatever, but there's 20 named characters that could be part of your crew that are companions in the game. And then Will goes on and says, four of them are from Constellation and have the most story and interaction with the player but all of the named characters have their own backgrounds and can follow you around and carry your stuff. So there's going to be 20 over 20 named characters that actually follow you into battle, but only four of them are from Constellation. So a good 16 plus are going to be uh, characters you find out in the world that you can have. You can recruit them to join you on your crew. That is very, very awesome. And speaking of crew, the next question we're going to go through is, will our companions be able to level up their perks? Will their perks stack with ours, the player's perks? The question or the uh, answer from Will is, all crews start with a set of perks at specific ranks. And they kind of go through, and Mills pops in and he says, they do not level up, but they come in at different ranks depending on the companion. They also go on, it is freaking Awesome. It says, uh, Will says, so you might meet a character that's especially good at rifles and you can hire them to watch your back. Or you might meet an astrodynamics expert who will increase your grav jump range when assigned to your ship. So depending on where you put them, they will actually increase the stats. Like in that case, if you assign that expert to your ship, it will increase your jump range, your hyperdrive, basically. So you're able to jump farther each time, which is very, very cool. They go on, you know, ML comes in and he says, some are there for flavor to highlight the companion's backgrounds and interests. So some of them really don't affect the gameplay. It's more of kind of like a flavor of a, their background. So you can kind of get a, a feel for their personality, but some of them are specific and they stack with your stats. So in that scenario, if someone has a handgun stat, one of your companions does, it will actually increase your overall stat because you have handguns, they have handguns, you guys both go together. So it sounds like, just like in every other Bethesda game, you're doing all the work, they're just kind of helping in the background. You can't just like sick your companions on everybody and have them do the fight for you. They're more there to just back you up to help increase your specific setup, your play style. Which is really, really cool. I like that in like, uh, like in Skyrim, you can have companions there and they do a little bit of damage, but for the most part, whenever you go into a fight, you're doing everything and they're just kind of like running around, helping you out a little bit, which I appreciate. I like that kind of play style for personally. Okay. So this next one is actually really, they actually answered a lot about this next question, which is really interesting to me tells me that they did a lot of work on this, which is really, really awesome. But here's the question. What are the beliefs and basic history of the religions that we can join in the game? And then they lay, uh, they label off the uh, three ones that we know about so far. This is the Sanctum Universum, Enlightened, and the Great Serpent Religions. Those are the three unique ones that are only in Starfield. Well, they're in Starfield, and those are the ones that they focus on. So jumping to the answers from Emil, existing in real life religions are part of Starfield with forks of uh, folks of religions and denominations are out there, but we really don't focus on them in Starfield. Instead, we highlight the three specific ones that are made for Starfield. So all the religions are there, 
and you you might be able to run into them, but it sounds like you're going to be mostly dealing with the three specific ones that are in Starfield and created for Starfield. And then they kind of go through the uh, the differences between them. So they have the Sanctum Universum that's the only a couple de decades old in Starfield. They believe that God is out there, uh, like a physical thing. It is out there in the universe and that humanity's ability to travel to the stars brings us closer to God. So literally that the uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, Sanctum Universum, they believe that God is physically out there and we can go to God because we can travel through warping and all that kind of stuff. We can travel at light speed and we're supposed to find him or her or it out in the universe, which is very, very interesting. In my mind, I didn't even consider that, but that is part of their religion, which is really, really awesome. Then they have the Enlightened. They are an atheist group that focus on humanitarian and community work. So they don't believe in any God whatsoever. They're more focused on, they, they right here from Will, they believe that life is something every person has to take responsibility for so that if we want a, the world to be a better place, we have to do it. So they're out there, they're purposely trying to do good things because they don't believe that there is a, a higher being out there and we have to make the good that's in the world, which is a really cool, unique idea. Well, maybe not unique, but it's an interesting, cool spin on it that they've thrown in there. And then the last one, the third uh, religion that they talk about is called the House of Varun. Also, the you know, the Great Serpent religion, the one that really focuses on snakes and things like that in Starfield. Now, they go through, Emil says, the gossip around the guards is that a colony ship set off for a new world making grab jumps along the way. After one of the grab jumps, one of the passengers claims he spent that time communing with a celestial entity known as the Great Serpent. What was a few seconds for everyone else was much longer for him and this passenger, and he brought back a mandate, which is basically get on board or be devoured when the Great Serpent encircles the universe. So that is pretty awesome. So there's a whole religion that's dedicated to this, this Great Serpent that is actually going to swallow up the entire universe which is really weird really awesome it is so they put a lot of thought and detail into the backgrounds of all three of these religions which i love and it sounds like because there's so much background there you're going to be able to go in and out maybe even join some of these religions throughout the story of starfield which i find really really fascinating really really interesting they also mentioned in the starfield direct back in uh, june that depending on which religion you're part of you can only get into certain sections of space, of the galaxy. So if you're part of one religion, they'll let you in. But if you're not part, they'll say, nope, you can't enter. You cannot come here unless you're part of our religion, which is really, really cool. So maybe there are certain missions you'll never see unless you join that religion in the game, which is really cool. I like that idea. Oh, dang it. I've, there's a question in here. I should have thrown it in there. Maybe future Jason will edit this, but probably not because I know future Jason is busy. So, there's a question that is, when we assign the crew members to work at an outpost, do we have to pay them salaries? Which is a really good question. So, you have all these crew members that you're hiring and you can put them on your ship. You can put them at a base. There's base building in No Man's Sky. Or in, uh, in Starfield, not No Man's Well, No Man's Sky too, but in Starfield, there is base building. And you can assign crew there. But do you pay them salaries? Like, is it constant or what? And Emil says, nope, you just pay them one time. We actually experimented with paying them on our regular salaries, but the ultimate, ultimate ultimately decided to just have the cost up front because, you know, and later on he says, there is a lot to do in Starfield and we wanted to minimize what the player had to constantly keep track of. So it sounds like when you hire a crew member, you have to pay them up front. There's also, they mention one-time payment that you can use a speech challenge game to negotiate over. Some traits also affect that cost. So. If you have high charisma, you're able to talk to them and negotiate the price when you first hire them. But it's only a one-time deal. You pay them once when you hire them, and then you're done. You don't have to worry about constantly paying them over and over all the time, which is really, really cool. Keeps it simple. Pay them once, you're done. 
So the next question in the uh, developer Q&A was, uh, how will the smuggling cargo system work? Can we hide it somewhere on the ship and sell it for more currency later on? And Will pops in immediately and he says, certain items are considered contraband and you'll need to be they'll need to be smuggled past security ships that are in orbit o over major settlements. So when you go to land on a major city, they will scan you first to make sure you don't have any contraband and you need to block that or you need to, to get it past them somehow. And a mill pops in and he says, yes, you can hide them using special ship modules that you can purchase. So, you know, don't get caught with any uh, harvested organs. Okay, that's kind of crazy. And it says he also says the economy is fixed, but prices of bought and sold goods can change based on the skills you have. So that's also another secondary um, situation there because now we know you can't like buy an item cheap at one town or city and then fly to a different city and sell it for more of an expensive price. Everything is all set. The economy is the same, but you can negotiate the price. So it's not based on the system. It's actually based on your skill on trading. So you can negotiate it down. If your charisma is high enough, maybe you can talk to the trader and say, hey, can I get it for a little bit cheaper of a price? So there's not going to be any like uh, economy exploits. I mean, there probably will be, but not traditional like, hey, Buy, buy it from this system and sell it to that system and you'll make a ton of money. That's generally not going to happen. So the last one I'm going to cover in this uh, video was uh, one of the cooler ones that I kind of uh, was interested in, but it looks like it's not going to happen. So let's see. The question is, depending on traits selected during character creation, will it at all be possible to play through the game in a pacifist mode, i.e. without killing anyone or potentially anything? So is it possible to go through... The entire game and not kill any enemies or anything like that in the game and the answer i mean tldr no not possible however there are instances where you can actually convince people or enemies to walk away and not fight you so will says can't guarantee that every mission can be completed in a pacifist mode but you do have a couple of systems that will help do that in the game uh, ML says, uh, we talked early on about this during pre-production, whether or not we would fully support it or if it was possible. And we realized that for various reasons, it wasn't possible in the game. So there is one system is our speech challenge game where you can persuade someone to do something like not fight you. So you're able to, like, if you go and you can talk to uh, enemies, if you're able to, you know, confront them and tell them or convince them not to fight you, that's a way to do it, but not not all enemies will be able to be interacted like that. You cannot talk to some enemies, and so it's not feasible to do everything pacifist mode. But there is going to be a good portion of them, they say, in the storyline where you're able to do that. And then uh, Emil goes on and he says, The settled systems are the most civilized, but it can be a dangerous place if you go off the beaten path. And you're absolutely going to go off the beaten path in starfield so again if you're in major cities you can probably talk to people and they won't fight you or anything like that but when you get out in the far reaches of space those enemies they're not even going to question they will fire first and not even worry about it they're not going to talk to you you can't not convince them there are all there are also uh non-lethal weapons like tasers you know things like that that you can help you but again you're probably going to have to kill a few enemies in the storyline or just in general when you're going through the game as a whole so not a full not possible to do the full game but maybe maybe there's gonna be mods out there remember guys it's starfield it's a bethesda game there will be mods maybe there'll be a whole bunch of mods to adjust that and give you a stealth mode or ways to uh take to finish the game without killing any enemies in the game which is really really awesome so guys I am super pumped up. Starfield is coming out in less than two weeks or in about two weeks. I think it's 17 days at this point. I'm losing track of my mind. I'm cutting videos. I'm doing all this stuff. So a couple weeks from now, basically, we will be playing Starfield in early access September 1st. Remember, September 1st is when early access starts. If you pre-order the deluxe or premium edition, 
you can get in on September 1st. If you just have the regular edition, you have to wait till September 6th, which is five days later. Not a big deal. So the following uh, Tuesday. So, guys, I am so excited. Hopefully you guys are as well. If you are, hit that like button. And I will see you guys in the next video.